Our keynote speaker this evening for our, for our dinner is uh, well known in conservative circles. Hans von Spakowski is the longtime senior legal fellow and manager of the Heritage Foundation's Election Law Reform Initiative. He's also a former member of President Trump's Advisory Commission on Election Integrity and served as a member of the Federal Election Commission. You can imagine the conversation around the conference table when we began planning this event. Uh, our board in July of this year asked us to start figuring out how mountain states could join in the fight to protect the integrity of the ballot box and also preserve the Electoral College, both of which are under serious attack in this election and will be increasingly uh, in the future. Hans obviously immediately came to mind as an expert on, and I realize expert is a bad word this today, but roll, roll with me. Uh, <laughs> Uh, he is the expert on the issue and we needed, uh, that we needed for our team and for our board as we continue to educate ourselves to enable us to make smart decisions as we prepare to enter the fray. When I called Hans, my request was simply that. Uh, please come continue our education. If you've heard Hans before, you know you're in for a delightful, enlightening talk. So please join me in welcoming him to the podium. All right, well, I appreciate the invitation. I, I was telling Kristen, this, this, this is the first flight I've been on in six months. Because <laughs> I, I work in Washington, D.C., and I live in Virginia, although I have to tell you, my office, I've been working remotely from my dining room for the last six months because our office has been closed. Washington, D.C., unfortunately, has had one of the strictest rules in the country about staying shut down. Now, I know you heard that name, Hans von Spakovsky, and you're going, that guy's not from around here. <laughs> Well, and that's right, I was actually born and raised in Alabama, so. <laughs> Look, I've been working on elections now in the, uh, for 30 years. Um, starting off as a poll watcher when my arm got twisted uh, by the local uh, uh, Republican Party chairman in Fulton County in Atlanta. They really needed somebody to be a poll watcher. And uh, at that time, I was a bit younger and uh, they assigned me to one of the worst polling places in the city. It was a uh, housing project. And uh, none of the, you know, those of you, those of you who know folks in the Republican women's clubs know they're very active. But none of them wanted to volunteer to be in this housing project. So I went down there. And that was one of the things that helped get me interested in the election area, because you know, when I got down, there was a poll watcher. This was a general election. And you know what the people working at the registration desk were doing? This was an overwhelmingly Democratic precinct. There was just a very small number of, of uh, Republicans registered there. And when people came in to check in, to give their name so they could check the voter registration list, the people who were working there were saying, well, are you a Republican or a Democrat? And the clear, what was clearly going on is they wanted to intimidate Republicans coming in so that they wouldn't vote. Fortunately, I was the sole poll watcher there and I got out my cell phone and I called it in and it wasn't too long before somebody from the county election board came down there and told them to stop doing that. But that told me how important, for example, poll watchers are because if there aren't poll watchers there to see and report on things, all kinds of things can happen. But it also emphasized for me something that my parents had told me. Uh, but that, that's what got me interested in this. But, but I understood how important voting was because of my parents. Um, you know, I was joking about being born and raised in Alabama. That's true, but I'm a first generation American. Okay, my mother grew up in Nazi Germany. My father was a Russian, a white Russian who had escaped the communists, and they met in a refugee camp in the American-occupied sector of Germany in 1946. Okay, and my childhood, growing up in Alabama, was filled with stories from them about what it was like living in a dictatorship. And the biggest lesson I learned from them uh, was something that Ronald Reagan uh, actually said, you know, in a very famous uh, statement about the fact that you you can lose your freedom very quickly. It's not something that uh, is permanent. It can it can be lost in one generation. 
And the fundamental part of preserving our freedoms is uh, fair and secure elections. And what I'm going to talk to you about now is something that uh, the mainline, the mainstream news media tells you doesn't exist, election fraud. And, there, and I'm going to talk to you also about something they say, well, you don't need to worry about, and that's election integrity. Now, in 2008, um, the Indiana's, uh, state of Indiana passed one of the first voter ID laws in the country. I mean, it's still amazing to me, you all probably realize that, that in a majority of states in this country, you don't have to show an ID to vote. If you show up at a polling place in New York, uh, you just give them a name and they hand you a ballot. <laughs> Same thing in California. Um, Indiana passed one of the first photo ID laws. That's one of the re election reforms I've, I've recommended for years. And you know, they were sued, of course, by twice the usual number of suspects on the left. And that case went all the way to the US Supreme Court. The Supreme Court upheld Indiana's photo ID law said it was perfectly constitutional, it wasn't a burden on voters. And they said this, they said, the United States unfortunately has a long history of voter fraud. It's been documented by journalists and historians, and it could make the difference in a close election. And of course, that's the key, right? A close election. That's exactly the same thing that the Carter-Baker Commission said in 2005. You all may recall after the 2000 election, uh, former Democratic President Jimmy Carter and former Secretary, Republican Secretary of State James Baker formed a federal commission on election reform, made a whole long series of recommendations, including recommending a voter ID requirement. And they also said it could make the difference in a close election. Now, given the fact that liberals are so set on pushing this myth that there's no fraud in our elections, we don't need to be concerned about it, you might wonder, why did Jimmy Carter sign on to that and say, yeah, we do need to be concerned about fraud? Well, little known fact is that um, when Jimmy Carter first ran for office, he ran for the state legislature in Georgia, and the local political machines literally stole his election. They committed fraud to make sure he would lose. And he actually went to court and sued, and he won his case. That's the only reason he ended up in the state legislature, and that was the start of his political career. Very different, of course, from Lyndon B. Johnson, who, as you know, it's proven, uh, the local uh, political machine stole his election for the Senate in his favor. There's a very famous story about, it's called Ballot Box 13. If you haven't heard about this, go, you know, Google it, you can read the story, the, the guys who did it admitted it long after the fact that they basically stuffed ballot boxes to make sure he would win. If they hadn't done that, he might not have ended up as the president of the United States. So that tells you how fraud can affect uh, elections. Now a couple of years, and, and what's the reason for this? It's because we in almost every state have an honor system in our election process. Now, most people think, for example, when you register to vote, right, you fill out that very easy one-page form, and you mail it in. Everybody assumes that when election officials get that, why, they must check and verify that information, right? They check to make sure that's a real address, that it's a residential address, that you're a real person. They check to make sure you're really a U.S. citizen, like when you check, because one of the things you have to do is check the box and say, yes, I'm a U.S. citizen. They don't do that. They don't do anything. They don't verify any of that information. They simply take the information on the form, enter it into their computer system, and they mail you a voter registration card. It's an honor system. And in many places, like I said, around the country, you don't even have to show an ID when you go in to vote. And that's why we have all kinds of problems. Um, a couple of years ago, I got so tired of hearing the left and the New York Times, the Washington Post say, oh, there's no election fraud in the country, that we started a database at the uh, Heritage Foundation, you can see it on our website, it's called our election fraud database, of proven voter fraud cases. Now, this is not a comprehensive list. 
It's just a sampling of cases from around the country. It only goes back about two decades. We're, we're up to almost 1,300 proven cases of election fraud. And by proven, I mean somebody was convicted in a court of law or a judge ordered a new election or a, for example, as happened in North Carolina two years ago, the State Board of Elections overturned an election and ordered a new election. 1,300 cases. Now some of them are just one voter taking advantage of the vulnerabilities of the system and cheating by, for example, registering in two different states and voting in the same election, which is highly illegal. But there are other cases in there like 1997 in Miami, Florida, where in a mayor's race, uh, the election was overturned and the judge who overturned it estimated there were 5,000 fraudulent absentee ballots submitted in that election. The newspapers, which these days say, oh, there's no election fraud, you know, the Miami Herald actually won a Pulitzer Prize for its investigation into that election. You know, whenever I mention that case, people say, oh, that's old, that happened a long time ago. So then I say, well, what about two years ago? Two years ago, we had congressional elections, right? There was one contested congressional race in the country in North Carolina the 9th Congressional District. And that election was overturned by the State Board of Elections. Why? Well, because it turned out uh, the Republican candidate in the race hired a well-known, I, actually I should say infamously known, political consultant to work for him. This was a guy who had previously worked for Democratic candidates running in the election. And it turned out that he was engaging in illegal vote harvesting. Now, you've heard that term a lot. A lot of people say, what the heck is vote harvesting, okay? Look, in every state, including this one, you can vote uh, by absentee ballot. Actually, Utah is now all mail, mail ballots. But in 45 states that don't have all mail elections, you, most people vote in person, but you know, you can vote by absentee ballot. In a lot of states, you don't have to have a reason. Um, in some states, you have to have a reason, like you're gonna be out of town on election day. In about half of those states, uh, well, sorry, in all of those states, you can mail your election back, I mean, your, your ballot back. Um, you can hand deliver it to election officials, or a member of your family can hand deliver it to election officials. Nobody else is supposed to do that, it's illegal. But in about half the states, including, for example, California, um, They've made it legal for anybody, any stranger, to come to your door and say, hey, I'll deliver your ballot for you. Now, what does that do? It puts something very valuable, a valuable commodity, a ballot, into the hands of candidates, campaign staffers, party activists, political consultants, all of whom have a stake in the outcome of the election. Now, North Carolina, fortunately, bans vote harvesting. So when it was discovered that this political consultant and six of his staffers were collecting ballots, they were going to people's homes and collecting their absentee ballots, they started an investigation. Well, they weren't just collecting people's absentee ballots. With some voters, they were filling out the ballots instead of the voters filling them out. In some cases, they were stealing the ballots, forging signatures on it, and then submitting it. Now, he was caught, fortunately. He and his six staffers were, have all been criminally charged. And there were enough uh, ballots affected. There was only a 900 vote margin. Remember, we have close elections. They overturned the election and um, they held another race. Uh, a new Republican candidate uh, uh, squared off against the Democrat who had run, the Republican won. But, this was an election in which illegal vote harvesting was going on, and what was common, what was done in this election is the common factor you see in all of these proven absentee ballot fraud cases. First of all, who do they target? They target the elderly, and uh, they target um, often first-time voters. They target poor neighborhoods because those people are more vulnerable to their elections getting stolen, plus 
Remember, when you go vote in person, every state has what they call anti-electioneering laws, right? Candidates cannot come into the polling place and pressure you to vote a particular way. In fact, in, in every state, they can't even come close to the polling place. Well, those laws don't apply to your homes. And if you allow vote harvesting, then you're having people coming to your door who are going to say, you, you know, you really need to vote for this candidate. And they can coerce and pressure individuals. And that's a common factor in these proven absentee ballot fraud cases. By the way, the political consultant who did this in North Carolina, election officials actually had evidence that he had done it in the 2016 election. They forwarded that information to prosecutors. And what do you think the prosecutors did about it? Absolutely nothing. That's the other big problem. Um, the news media now will acknowledge that, oh yeah, there is election fraud because of our database of 1,300 proven cases. But their big angle now is, oh, this is, this is so small in comparison to the billions of votes cast. Well, there aren't billions of votes cast in a typical town council race or a county commission race or a state legislative race. And again, that's where it could make the difference. But the big problem is prosecutors don't go prosecute these cases. They don't even bother investigate. And I'll give you two examples of this, okay? Um, I was on a county election board, and, and I should say, just so you understand my background of this, yeah, I'm a, I work in a think tank these days, and I'm an analyst. But I got two things that most of the academics you see out there, and the reporters who call themselves big experts on this don't have, okay? First of all, I spent four years at the U.S. Department of Justice coordinating enforcement of federal voting rights laws. But second, when I lived in Atl practice law in Atlanta, I was on the county election board there in the biggest county in the state. The county election board, that's where the rubber meets the road. Elections in this country are run at the county level. So I was on the county board responsible for voter registration and running polling places in the biggest county in Georgia. When I moved to D.C., I ended up on the election board in Fairfax County, Virginia, which is the largest county in Virginia, where we also responsible for voter registration and running polling places. Well, uh, I was on that board for three years, and one year I said to our general registrar, are you guys checking with our voter, re voter registration records against DMV records? And they said, uh, no, why would we do that? I said, well, because in the state of Virginia, as in every other state, if you are a non-citizen who is in this country legally, you can get a driver's license. So I'm saying, why aren't you checking the voter registration list against DMV records? They said, well, we just never thought of that. So they did that, and what did we discover? 300 people who were registered in the, our county who, when they went to get their driver's licenses, said, produced documents saying, I'm not a US citizen. Half of them had voted in prior elections. We took them off the rolls. And then we had a fight in our, on our electoral board by the, uh, me and another conservative against the liberal on the board. I said, well, this is a felony under state law. It's a felony under federal law for an alien to register and vote. We need to send this to law enforcement officials. The liberal didn't want to do that. We outvoted him, fortunately. But we sent it to the local county commonwealth's attorney. That's their equivalent of a district attorney. And we sent it to the US Justice Department at that time under Barack Obama and Eric Holder. And what do you think they did about it? Absolutely nothing. And that is, unfortunately, uh, so often true. So, you know, we have this problem of an honor system. We also have the second problem. Um, and that's the fact that uh, every state maintains their own voter registration list. And a lot of states, like California and New York, don't do anything to compare their lists with other states. So that means it's relatively easy for somebody to get registered in more than one state, vote twice or three times in election, and not get caught doing it. And even if you do, your chances of getting prosecuted are pretty low. Now, remember I said we have 1,300 proven cases. Well, let me tell you how big this potential problem is. Um, Kristen mentioned I was appointed to Trump's advisory, presidential advisory commission on election integrity. 
I can tell you that when I and another good friend of mine named Christian Adams, who you may have seen on Fox, were appointed, the left went crazy that the two of us had, had been appointed to this. Now, this is a presidential advisory commission. It has no executive authority. All it can do is study a problem and issue a report. The, like I said, the left went crazy that the president had established this commission. We were supposed to look at the vulnerabilities in the American election system, try to figure out the extent of the possible problems, and then make recommendations on how to fix it. Well, you would have thought that, um, that the president had established uh, some kind of horrible commission whose job it was to suppress voting, which is just ridiculous. All we wanted to do was research the problem and figure out, is there a problem and how big is it? In order to prevent the commission from even operating, leftist advocacy organizations like the ACLU and others filed a dozen lawsuits against the commission, protesting it even meeting, protesting my appointment to it. It were all frivolous, meritless lawsuits. But the very lean staff uh, assigned to this from the vice president's office was spending all their time trying to answer these ridiculous lawsuits. The second big thing that happened was the only way you can do research is if you have data, right? All these states around the country, almost all of them uh, blue states, but even a couple of red states, said we are not giving this commission any data. Because what we needed to do this kind of research was, was two things. Every state's statewide voter registration list and every state's voter histories. So we know the names of people who are registered and which elections they voted in. Now, we didn't care who they voted for. You can't tell that. But we needed that data so we could do basic comparisons. All these states said, we're not providing you with that data. So the president, we only had two meetings. The president shut down the commission because we couldn't get the work done. Yet every time there's an article written about this, like uh, Reuters did a hit piece on me uh, a couple of weeks ago, they say, oh, the president's commission, which didn't find any voter fraud. Well, we never had a chance to look, OK? So here's the reason I tell you this story, sorry, is because uh, not too long ago, you know, I work at the Heritage Foundation, but I'm also on the board of a foundation like Mountain States Legal called the Public Interest Legal Foundation. And the president of that organization, Christian Adams, was also appointed by the president to Trump's commission. So we decided we would do privately what we weren't able to do publicly with the commission. So we went and we bought the statewide voter registration list and voter histories from as many states as we could get them. We got 42 states. Three states were in the midst of suing because they won't give us this data, which is public data. Okay. Then we took that information and we supplemented it. And the reason is I, voter registration data is pretty sparse, OK? And if you're comparing, for example, Utah and California, you'd be amazed at how many people have exactly the same name and the same birth date. <laughs> so if we want to know if Joe Smith, born on March 1st in California, is the same as Joe Smith born on March 1st, who's living in Utah, you have to have more information. So we did something that nobody's ever done. We went to commercial data houses, including all the big credit agencies, like Equifax. And we supplemented the data so that when we were comparing statewide voter registration lists, we knew if the Joe Smith we found in California was the same Joe Smith in, in Utah. We just issued a report, and you know what we found? We found almost 15,000 people who, in the 2016 and 2018 elections, were credited by state election departments with having voted after they were dead. And they didn't all live in Chicago. <laughs> we found um, over almost 82,000 individuals who were registered twice in the same state, from the same address, who voted twice, which is highly illegal. We found 14,000 people who are registered in more than one state, 
and voted twice in the different states, all of which is illegal. Oh, and we found, um, you know, when you register to vote, right, you have to vote where you live. You can't register at a UPS store, okay? You can't register at a gas station. You can't register at a casino if you live in Nevada. And the reason for that is, if you do that, remember, when you're voting, you're voting for the representatives who represent where you live. If you register someplace else, you're basically cheating the system. We found 34,000 people who were registered illegally at commercial addresses who had cast votes in the 2016 and 2018 elections. That totals over 144,000 cases of potential election fraud. Oh, by the way, uh, and I wrote a story about this, uh, four of the individuals who we found in California who were illegally registered at a business address were registered to vote and cast absentee ballots from the headquarters of NPR West in Culver City, California. <laughs> this is, by the way, the same NPR who re did a great report in July about the fact that the Republican congressman from Kansas, a guy named Steve Watkins, was, had three felony charges filed against him because he registered to vote as a UPS store. Now, my point of all this is that our 1,300 cases, like I said, it's just the tip of the iceberg. There's so many other cases out there because the security systems we have in place are almost non-existent. And even when problems like this are found, um, uh, election officials often don't want to do anything about it. And law enforcement doesn't want to investigate it. Uh, let me just give you one more example of this that shows you what's going on with this. Um, the Public Interest Legal Foundation did something very interesting starting in Virginia. Uh, they went to every county registrar in the state and said, because this is public data, we want the name of every registered voter who uh, contacted you and said, please take us off the voter rolls because I am not a U.S. citizen. Okay, so this isn't election officials finding the problem. This is the registered voter coming and saying, take me off the roll, I'm, a, I'm not a U.S. citizen, I shouldn't be registered. Uh, they found over 5,500 non-citizens who had done that in Virginia, but not before they had cast 7,500 ballots. And this is a state in which We've had two state attorney general's races in the last dozen years decided one by less than 1,000 votes and one by less than 300 votes. Now, this report got a lot of publicity. Uh, do you think election officials in any of those counties had sent the names of those individuals to county district attorneys to investigate and prosecute? No. Not a single one of these aliens was prosecuted for this. So there's another potential 5,500 cases that we could add to our database if something were done about it. Now, every time anyone on the, who believes in campaign reform comes up with a recommendation to make our system more secure, the left opposes it, okay? Look, if, we, if you wanna clean up this system, what we need to do, first of all, is every state needs to have a voter ID law. And by voter ID, I mean a voter ID requirement that applies to both in-person voting and absentee balloting. That can be done. It's been done in a couple of states. And all these claims you hear that, oh my God, this is vote suppression, right? It's going to keep people out of the polls. That is not true. We know it's not true because you, well, you never hear this. Every single state that's put in a voter ID requirement, like Indiana, like Georgia, like Texas, South Carolina, has put in a provision that says, if you don't have an ID, the state will provide you one for free. And those laws now, in like places like Georgia and Indiana, they've been in place for over 10 years. We have 10 years worth of turnout data 
So we know what happened to uh, voter turnout after the IDs were in place. And not only did turnout not go down, including of minority voters, in most of the states it went up. I think, nobody knows why, I think it's because it gives people more confidence, you know, in, in the election process, and that's important. But the, the point is that the, the, the turnout data shows that that's just not true. Um, the other thing we need is uh, every state ought to require proof of citizenship when you register to vote. Because I can tell you that is a problem all over the country. It is extremely easy for you as a non-citizen to get registered and to vote. And um, the estimates vary on how big of a problem this is. Uh, but there was an academic study that came out just a couple of years ago based on a, what they call a, a, a the congressional survey. This is a survey that a lot of universities do of people who have voted. And based on that survey data, these three professors estimated that in the 2008 election, a little over 6% of the non-citizens who were in the United States had voted in that election. Now, 6% doesn't sound like a lot, but they pointed out that this could have made the difference, for example, in North Carolina, which uh, Barack Obama won by only 14, I think it's 14,000 votes. Uh, but that's a problem all over. So we need proof of citizenship when you register to vote. Also, um, Election officials aren't doing two very basic things they ought to be doing. The Department of Homeland Security has a huge database. And the database has information on all non-citizens who are in this country legally. And they have information on, on aliens who are in this country illegally who have at some point been arrested and detained. Now, they don't have information on illegal aliens who've never been caught. But I don't know how, those of you who, who uh, own companies or employers, you know that federal law, right, requires you when you are hiring a new employee, you've got to verify that they're a U.S. citizen or that they're a non-citizen who's here legal, who's got a work permit. DHS runs a facility that's open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that an employer can call to check that information out. There's not a single election official anywhere in the country that's taking advantage of that to check the citizenship status of people who are registering to vote. Why not? Or to just give you another quick example, all these people who are registered at gas stations and casinos and vacant lots, there's no reason for that. What is the one thing that county, county governments everywhere have a terrific record of because it's how they make money, right? property tax records, right? The, the county governments, they know every single piece of property in a county, and they know whether it's a residential property or an industrial property or a commercial property. They know that, and they know what's there because they're collecting taxes on it. So why aren't election officials in every county checking when somebody sends in a registration form, why aren't they checking that data against the county tax records? It would immediately tell them, wait a minute, this person's registering in a vacant lot. There's obviously something wrong with it. They're not doing that. It is a simple fix, and yet uh, they're not doing that. Now, let me just quickly turn to this election. You've seen this big push now to get everybody to vote by mail. This is exclusively just about coming from the left. Um, here's what you need to understand about this. Uh, yeah, people vote by absentee ballot in this country. But the more people who vote by mail, the bigger the number of people who will be disenfranchised, and the bigger the number of people whose votes won't count. And here's why, and this is nothing new. The rejection rate for absentee ballots is about double that of ballots cast in person. And there's a reason for that. If you go into a polling place and there's some kind of problem, for example, with your registration, there's an election official there who can answer your questions and try to remedy the problem. There's no election official in anybody's homes. And voters make mistakes. If you look at all the recent primaries that have occurred, particularly in places like New York, 
where they encourage huge numbers of people to vote by absentee ballot. You know what the rejection rate was in New York for their June 23rd primary? One in five absentee ballots were rejected. And it's because, like I said, voters make mistakes. They forget to sign the ballot. If you don't sign your absentee ballot, election officials are going to throw it out. It's not going to count. Uh, you have to, how many people here voted absentee? Okay, you know, right, you have to fill in certain information on the absentee ballot. You know, your registered address, your name, all that. If you don't complete all that information, your ballot's going to get thrown out. It's going to get rejected. If the post office forgets to postmark your ballot so that election officials don't know whether you actually cast your ballot by the end of election day, your ballot will get thrown out. And you are dependent on who? The US Postal Service to deliver your ballot in time. And if they don't deliver it in time, it's gonna not count. And because of that, the rejection rate is much higher. So it is a bad idea to vote by mail unless you absolutely have to. By the way, on the US Postal Service, um, in November of last year, the Postal Service Inspector General issued a report on the 2018 election. And the report was on election mail. Absentee ballots were considered election mail. And what the Inspector General looked at was did the Postal Service meet its standards for delivery on time. And of course, that's a key. You want that absentee ballot delivered on time or your ballot's not going to count. Um, do you know what the goal was of the Postal Service for on-time delivery? 96%. Not 100%, but 96%. So even if they reach their goal, 4% of all the absentee ballots in the country were not going to count. That's millions of ballots. Now, they didn't do too bad. The, the inspector general says nationally, they on average uh, got, uh, achieved 95.6%. However, there were a number of states that did a lot worse, because that was the average. And they listed seven states where the on-time delivery was only 84%. That means that 16% of the ballots in those states that people mailed back may not have been delivered in time to be counted. That is a huge number of ballots of voters who that aren't going to get counted in the election. So you shouldn't depend on uh, the US Postal Service for this. Now, there have been lawsuits filed all over the country, because not only is the left pushing for everybody to vote by mail, but they're trying to use COVID-19 to achieve their other goals. The lawsuits are all have the same thing in common. Unfortunately, they've achieved uh, judges giving them this in a bunch of states. Um, they're saying that states should not do signature comparison. That'll just slow things down and, and vote ballots won't get counted. In, other, uh, in the lawsuits, they're also saying, oh, and by the way, if you have a witness signature requirement for an absentee ballot, you can't enforce that. Uh, they're also saying, uh, and they've achieved this, they've actually gotten or, uh, 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 court orders on this. For example, in Pennsylvania, courts saying, oh, we're going to extend the deadline for the receipt of these absentee ballots, and you have to count them even if there's no postmark on the envelope. Now, what does that mean? It means that uh, the day after the election, if a particular candidate is losing, what's that candidate going to do? They're going to send their vote harvesters around to different neighborhoods and say, have you did you vote your absentee ballot? And if they didn't, they're going to collect them and send them in so they can change the results of the election. Oh, and by the way, the other big thing they've been pushing is in any state that bans vote harvesting, they're saying, oh, you can't apply the vote harvesting law. You're trying to suppress votes. You've got to allow folks to go and pick up the ballot because of COVID-19. Now, I want you to think about this. On the one hand, they're saying, Everybody's got to vote by mail, and you can't have witness signature requirements because COVID-19 is just too dangerous. Yet at the same time, they're saying, oh, no, no, you've got to allow strangers to go door to door in a neighborhood to pick up ballots. 
as if that isn't going to spread COVID-19 faster than anything I can think of. But what that tells you is, is they're trying to use COVID-19 as a way of getting all these provisions in. And in fact, I know that because all of these provisions were in HR 1. The moment Democrats took over the House of Representatives in 2018, the first bill they dropped was HR 1. It was, Chris, what was it, 700, 800 pages long? It was a complete takeover by the federal government of the election process run by the states. And it included provision, all these provisions I'm talking about, those were all in there. So was saying all voter ID laws are thrown out, you can't, you can't enforce them. The other thing, by the way, that they're doing, and this I'm sure sounds very innocuous to you, right? They're saying, remember, when you get an absentee ballot in just about every state, you have to put a stamp on the envelope that you're mailing it back in, right? Well, their argument is that that is just too much. Uh, what's the price of a stamp these days? 60 cents? 70? 60 cents? Oh my God, that's a, such a burden on voters. You can't require them to spend 60 cents on a stamp. Therefore, you have to send them a pre-stamped envelope. Now that sounds innocuous, but you realize what that means. If you put an envelope in your mailbox that's already been postmarked, the Postal Service isn't going to postmark it again. So that means if you vote after Election Day, they're going to have no idea that you voted after Election Day because the postmark on it that the election officials put on it before they send it to you is for weeks before. So that's another way of getting ballots in that have been cast after the election. Um, they have been filing lawsuits like this for years, trying to get the process changed so that it's easier to cheat and easier to manipulate election results. And unfortunately, they have a huge number of organizations, nonprofit advocacy organizations, who are involved in doing this. Everybody from the ACLU to La Raza to, I, I mean, I can't list you all the different groups they have doing this. And do you know how much money uh, uh, left-wing donors and big foundations have poured into just this, changing election rules over the past couple of years? $600 million. Now on our side, we've got some very valiant, some tough fighters, but we've only got like two or three organizations. So when Kristen tells me land, that, that uh, Mountain States wants to get into this, please do. Because in almost every one of these cases, uh, we are outspent and totally outlawed by the other side. It's not that their lawyers are better, they just have a lot more of them. Um, and I don't know why it is, but folks on our side just don't concentrate on this, making sure that the rules are fair so that we can actually get people elected who we think will do what we want them to do when they get into office. Um, so we need more people in the litigation area to help us fight this kind of thing, particularly because of this reason. A lot of these lawsuits that are being filed, particularly this year, are what I call collusive litigation. In other words, the, for example, a, a liberal group will file a lawsuit saying, you know, you really, uh, you really can't apply a witness signature requirement and the attorney general happens to be a Democrat who agrees with that. So rather than fighting the lawsuit, he says, oh, sure, we'll settle the case. We'll do whatever you want. That's happened in case after case. And the only way that can be stopped is if there are conservative litigators and nonprofit organizations who are willing to try to intervene in the lawsuit and say, we want to defend this. So we need more. We need more boots on the ground, and for that we need more money, and we need more organizations involved in doing this. Um, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll end with this, and I'll be happy to answer questions. Uh, this is a fight we cannot walk away from, because if they change the rules the way they want to, it's going to make it very difficult for people to get elected, and the amount, the ease with which elections uh, can be stolen is just going to go up. And we've got to prevent that. Um, I think it was, well, a lot of people said this. I think Thomas Jefferson originally may have said this, that you know, the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. And even in a great democratic republic like we are, 
We not only need that vigilance, we need the ability to fight to maintain it. And that's the only way we're going to be able to do it is if we take up this fight and win it. Thanks. Um, when you're talking about people registering to vote at gas stations or empty lots or, right. or anything, um, how do you account for homeless people? Because they're allowed to vote. And I've often heard, been told, like, okay, what do I do if I'm homeless? Well, you, you, can, you describe the underpass where you're living. Or, the, or, you, or I, I don't mean to be joking, but, like, you, oh, no, no, you, you describe the location. Right. So I'm curious how you account for that. Right. No, no. Th that's a good question. And, and, look, the rule is, and I have no objection, the rule is you have to... You have to register where you reside. So it's okay, for example, to register at a homeless shelter. If you're a battered woman who's left her home and you're in a, a battered women's shelter, you can register to vote there. That you can do. But um, there's a video that's going to come out next week. Um, I think it's okay that I could, I could talk about this. Um, the Public Interest Legal Foundation uh, went to Nevada a week or so ago with a camera crew, and they went to the registered addresses of all these different voters um, to show what the locations are, and they found everything from vacant lots to pawn, pawn shops and other places where people are clearly not living. So yeah, there is a way to deal with that issue, but that is, that is a tiny microcosm of the problem with people illegally registering other places and using that to cast illegal, illegal ballots. Can you address how social media is affecting and manipulating election results? I'm sorry, how social media is affecting? Right, so remember Ted Cruz had the interview with Zuckerberg and how, or, well, actually it was with a, a a liberal, a very liberal person who had studied the power of social media to affect elections. Oh, right. And he said it was something like t possibly 20% influence. Um, look, what I'll say about that is I think it's pretty clear that a lot of the big social media platforms, I mean, they have a political agenda. And uh, they are very biased. In fact, um, we just noticed that uh, uh, the Heritage Foundation has produced some uh, videos about voting issues. And one of the things we did is we just produced a video pointing out the problems with mail-in voting. And it cites the actual data that I was telling you about with rejection rates, and yet uh, YouTube has put an a, uh, advisory on it. Because they don't like the fact that, they're, that we're actually telling the truth about this. So social media, unfortunately, has, I, I think, a lot of effect, particularly on the young. And it's extremely biased uh, in, in just one direction. And what do we do about that? I, I'm, I'm not sure how to, how to solve that problem. Uh, recently, Project Veritas came out with another. Yes. Uh, can you another video series? Can you comment on what's yeah. going on there? Um, for those of you who haven't seen it, Project Veritas has this this great undercover video that shows what looks like illegal vote harvesting going on in Minnesota, uh, including bribing and buying the absentee ballots of young voters. This all seems to be taking place in the Somalian immigrant uh, community. But what's interesting to me about it is, and there's a lot of sources saying, oh yeah, this is, this is definitely happening, they're, they're buying votes, um, is that part of it is who are they preying on? I mean, there's this one 
particular video where they, they talk about how they went in and confiscated the absentee ballots of all these senior citizens in these particular towers where they live. And there's nothing unusual about this, unfortunately. This is, a, again, a common factor in these kinds of cases. And if it weren't for this undercover video, as you know, the Washington Post, the New York Times, everybody says, oh, this just doesn't happen, and nothing would be done about it. Now, supposedly, I think the local district attorney has said they're there investigating it. Um, this is also illegal under federal law, and the FBI ought to be there investigating it. Uh, I don't have any confidence that will happen because the current head of the FBI, Chris Wray, doesn't seem very interested in, in doing this. Um, but again, that's, that's typical of the way this is ha handled. You can find a similar description of exactly this kind of thing going on in Indiana. Uh, I just published a paper, if you're interested. Um, I got so, again, I got so tired of people saying there's no absentee ballot fraud. I just published a paper for Heritage about a month ago called Four Stolen Elections. And it outlines its case studies of four elections that were overturned because of massive widespread absentee ballot fraud. And one of them is a case in Indiana, uh, East Chicago, Indiana, uh, that was overturned by the state Supreme Court. And they describe, again, that the, the, the voters who were targeted for the absentee ballots were senior citizens, first-time voters, uh, minority and poor voters, and voters for whom English is a second language. So that's just typical. There have been reports of military ballots that have ended right. up in the garbage. Could you elaborate on that at all? Yeah, yeah Philadelphia has been um, really busy lately in Pennsylvania. I don't know if you all saw this, but uh, now, a month and a half ago, uh, the U.S. attorney in Philly actually indicted a former Democratic congressman who, uh, th this was a guy probably, how many of you remember the Abscam scandal? Remember when the members of Congress were caught taking bribes? Well, this was one of those congressmen. And when he left Congress, he became a political consultant. And he's just been indicted for paying an election official in a polling place in Philadelphia to literally stuff the ballot box with fake ballots on behalf of numerous candidates in multiple elections. Now, obviously, this couldn't have happened. New York Times says fraud doesn't occur. Uh, but the, what you're talking about is um, someone discovered uh, nine completed absentee ballots in a, in a trash can outside uh, a uh, county government building in, I think it's Luzerne County. And these were what are called UACAVA ballots. Uh, UACAVA, you know, Washington loves acronyms. Uh, UACAVA stands for the Uniformed and Overseas Citizens Absentee Voting Act. This is a law that was passed during the Reagan administration that guarantees the right of American military personnel and their families who are overseas and American civilians who are overseas to vote by absentee ballots in our elections. And these were UACAVA ballots. So these were obviously ballots from military personnel that had been returned and had gotten thrown out. Um, it's under investigation. The Justice Department says that the local DA, they're actually called them in. The FBI is investigating it to try to find out what happened and why it happened. But I will tell you that the largest group of disenfranchised voters, American voters, are military voters. And it's because um, oftentimes their ballots are delivered late because the delivery overseas uh, can take such a long time. And far too often their ballots don't get back in time to be counted, and that's, that's a real problem. One that you don't hear the news media talk about very much, because I don't think military voters are their favorite voters. I, uh, I have met uh, with, and I'd like your uh, comment on this, with a group of uh, CIA people that have left and are looking into fraud through the, once it comes back in and it's put in to uh, computers that through Google, some of these high tech that are obviously left-winning, 
they are able to delete and, and do some things as it goes after it's been brought into an administration and put through the ballots. Do you know anything about that? Well, there's a, there's a cybersecurity consulting firm, uh, I think headquartered in Texas, that says, yeah, I, I know who you're talking about, um, and I've seen their presentation. And what they are saying is that um, they think there are problems with, uh, it's not the voting machines themselves, the electronic ones that in the polling places, it's the software and hardware being used in county government buildings by the election department that total up the votes. And they're in, according to their presentation, they're saying that the security protocols that county governments have to prevent intrusion into those computer networks, well, the word they used was pretty much non-existent. I think that's the, the word they used. And they believe that there's evidence that there have been some shenanigans pulled. Uh, one, of the, one of the elections they point to is the, um, the governor's race in Kentucky. Uh, what I'll tell you is they put on a pretty good presentation. I'm not enough of an expert on hardware and software to, to judge the credibility of that. What I do think is that they present a good enough case that I, I would hope that the Department of Homeland Security would actually investigate this and look into it. And I think, I think they've been trying to get DHS to, to do that, and I don't know where they are along that path. Actually, you should just come up to the podium and ask the question. <laughs> I understand that Michael Bloomberg has been paying bonds to get prisoners out of jail in Florida right. in order that they can vote. Right. Is that legal? Well, let me tell you what happened in Florida. Um, there was a referendum put on the ballot in, uh, I think, 2016 that said, uh, Florida used to be one of the states where when a felon got out of prison, in order to get his right to vote back, he had to apply to the state pardons and parole board. And they would review his application, basically try to see as a person turned over a new leaf and should we restore that right. Well, a referendum got put on the ballot there to change that so that a felon's right to vote would be automatically restored once they had completed all aspects of their sentence. Now, the key word there is all. The state legislature, after the referendum passed, passed a bill saying, well, all means all. So anything that is in the sentencing document has to be completed. That means jail time, probation, parole, and if you've been ordered to make restitution to your victim, say somebody you assaulted, you got to pay that back first. Uh, the ACLU and, like I said, the usual groups all sued and said, oh, you, you can't require that. That's the same as a poll tax. Uh, and they won. They got a federal district court judge, a very, a very big liberal, say, oh, yeah, yeah, you can't enforce that. That was appealed to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. And about two weeks ago, the 11th Circuit issued a terrific decision written by Bill Pryor, former Attorney General of Alabama, saying all means all. And there's nothing wrong with the state requiring uh, restitution and everything else to be paid before they restore the, the right to vote. It's not a poll tax. It's part of the punishment. So that moment that happened, uh, Michael Bloomberg came out and said, well, I will donate, and all these other groups said, we will donate the tens of millions of dollars needed to pay whatever court costs and, and restitution these felons have to uh, pay to get registered to vote. Okay. Well, here's the issue. Um, there's a federal statute that says that it is illegal and a felony to either offer to pay or to receive payment to register to vote or to vote. 
So in other words, it's of course illegal to vote somebody to vote for a particular person, but it's illegal to register, to pay somebody just to vote, no matter who they're going to, and it's illegal to pay somebody to register. So if, if any of these organizations in Bloomberg, if there's any connection between the payment they're making and registering to vote. In other words, if they're saying, uh, we'll pay your, your restitution at court costs if you register to vote, then they violate the law. If they simply say, well, we're just gonna pay the restitution of all felons and they don't require you to register to vote, well, then they're not, they're not violating federal law. But the potential is there if they're doing this and telling folks, this is so you will register to vote, that's, that's a violation of federal law. So hopefully we have active U.S. attorneys uh, down there who are looking into this. By the way, I just want to mention the fact that um, that 11th Circuit decision, which overturned that really stupid district court judge, that wouldn't have happened if not for the nominees that the president has put on the 11th Circuit, right? And, and I will tell you that one of the most valuable things that's happened in the last four years is the conservative nominees who have been put on federal courts throughout the country, including the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. Other than the candidate involved in a particular election um, and the prosecutorial system, uh, how would we, as a legal organization, find a client with standing to bring any kind of lawsuit to enforce these, these types of situations? Well, I'll give you an example, okay? Um, the National Voter Registration Act, everybody knows it as motor voter, right? You know, that's the provision that said all states, when you go get your driver's license, you also have to be offered the opportunity to register to vote. Well, it has a little known provision in it that liberal organizations don't like and don't want to see enforced. And it's a provision that says that um, election officials have to engage in regular maintenance of their voter registration lists. That means they have to, on a regular basis, clean up their voter lists by taking off people who have died and have moved out of state or become ineligible to vote, maybe because they've been convicted of a felony. And that law gave not only, directed not only the US Justice Department to enforce the law, it produced what's called a private right of action. So there are a small number of conservative organizations, such as the Public Interest Legal Foundation that I've talked about, who have been suing under that law to go after county governments and state governments that are clearly not doing that. And probably one of the best examples of this is um, the Public Interest Legal Foundation filed a lawsuit against, uh, I think it's Allegheny County, Pennsylvania, which I think is where Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh is. Um, and the reason they did it was because they used their new database which by the way is not, they're making it available to other organizations and to state authorities. They discovered when they checked the voter registration list, there were all these dead people on the voter rolls there. And they found one guy who was registered, he's alive, and he was registered seven times from the same address. And election officials had no idea. Which by the way, what does that tell you? It tells you that if that county and Pennsylvania decide to do what all these people are pushing them to do, which is don't wait for people to request an absentee ballot. Just simply mail an absentee ballot to every registered voter. You've got to do that because of COVID-19. Before this lawsuit, that guy would have gotten seven ballots in the mail. He could have signed them, filled them out, sent them in, and since election officials don't realize there's a problem, they would have counted all seven ballots. But that's just one of the that's one way that, that you can file a suit, is when you find out that county governments are not cleaning up their voter rolls. Now, one of the advantages of that lawsuit is if you win, you get attorney's fees and costs. <laughs> okay, it looks like I've exhausted you. <laughs> we 
We have time for one more. One more. It's not an MSLM event if Mr. Rump doesn't call the board. This is no seminal question. This is just a very straightforward remedy. What remedy possibly is available, uh, practically speaking, between now and the election? I'm sorry, what is it? What, whether what, what sort of remedy to all this, this problem? Is there a practical remedy, if there is any, between now and the, and the election? What can be done? Yeah, so what can be done between now and the election? Um, well, first of all, yeah, it's a very short time before the election, but right now there are still election officials all over the country making decisions about, all right, how many polling places are we going to have open? Are we going to not have the regular number open? Are we going to push everybody to vote by absentee ballot? Are we going to mail an absentee ballot to everybody? And I tell everybody I know, um, you, the grassroots right now ought to be besieging local county government election officials saying, I demand the right to vote in person. And you need to have as many polling places open as possible. Yeah, people who are at risk um, uh, should, can vote by absentee ballot. But you all need to understand, um, look, we're all going to gro our grocery stores, we're all going to our pharmacies, we're all going to Target and Walmart. All of those places have put in he the health safety requirements everybody's requesting, especially around the Washington area. You know, line spacing, mask wearing, um, sanitation stations inside and out. You can do all that in a polling place so that you can vote safely. In fact, we know that can be done because uh, Wisconsin held its primary on April 7th, right, right after all this started. And the Wisconsin Election Board actually put out this very extensive training and instruction manual for their polling places. I actually wrote a paper about this. And they did everything I'm talking about. They set up their polling places with uh, six-foot spacing, for the voters. They set it up so that there were sanitation stations where you could clean your hands inside and out. They told the poll workers, you have to clean every polling booth before a voter goes in and after the voter comes out. You will use disposable pens that you will hand to the voter to mark the paper ballots. The CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, what, they're our leading federal agency on this, right? They actually issued a report. You haven't seen any publicity about this. <laughs> I've written about it. Nobody else has. They actually wrote a report on the Wisconsin primary. And they tracked the number of COVID infections before the election and after the election. And you know what? The number of infect COVID infections uh, went down after the election. So they said there was no spike in COVID-19. As long as you follow those safety rules, you're gonna be able to vote in person. So right now, people need to be telling election officials, you need as many polling places open as possible. And you need to be talking to state, if the state legislature are talking about, for example, an emergency session or anything like that, about doing things like mailing, just mailing an absentee ballot to everybody, you need to say, you shouldn't be doing that. So, and, and the other thing that needs to happen is, uh, we need to be litigating in the states where the left has gone to court to try to force this, to try to prevent it from happening. An example of that, again, going back to Pennsylvania, where the Pennsylvania Supreme Court issued this stupid ruling. The Republican um, legislature there has just filed an emergency appeal with the U.S. Supreme Court to try to prevent and overturn the state Supreme Court, which, by the way, is another reason why we need to get that nice justice on the Supreme Court as soon as possible. <laughs> all right, y'all please join me. Oh, we have a, a small token of thanks for you coming Thank all you. the way to Utah and risking the airlines. Thank you. Thank you.